My name is Kurt Ritz. And I just start with Bridges in the Fall. I, before that, I was for 11 years at Rice University and in Houston, working in ministry there. Before that, in California and Iowa. And even before that time, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty old. Even before that time, I was a college student back in Wisconsin. And during that time, I had a coach who, who was an assistant basketball coach when I was in high school. And he was also a chaplain for the Green Bay Packers who had shared the Christian gospel with me. And he used a booklet like the one that you have in front of you. And as I, as I heard these things, I thought, well, seem pretty good. And if this is true, maybe I'd want to place my faith in Christ. But at the same time, I said, I just don't know. I mean, can I really believe that, that God is loving with the evil and suffering I see? And being separated from God for, for an eternity without Christ, that, that seems pretty harsh. Could I believe the Bible is the word of God? Now, we won't look at that specifically. There was another seminar about that. But I had these questions. And I wrestled with, does the Christian gospel make sense? And even going into it, I knew that I, didn't, I wouldn't have all the answers. And I wouldn't come to full knowledge. Because if there was a God, he, he could have full knowledge, but I wouldn't. But at the same time, I didn't want to just make a blind leap of faith and just, I guess, check my brain at the door. But I wanted to make it more of a, a step of faith where, yes, there would be faith. I understood that. But it would also be based on some things that were reasonable and some things that, that I, could, I could really understand, that this, this was a God that, that I could believe in. Now, as we go today, for some of the things that we look at, we'll be looking at Bible verses and what they say about it. There'll be some looking at Bible passages, but also some using reason and philosophy. And it's funny because there are some people who think, well, Christianity, that's all about faith. There's no reason, there's no philosophy. Well, I've learned, out Christian, learned that Christian philosophers and philosophy is a big part of it as well. Just using the mind and loving God with all our minds to understand some of these things better. So like I said, we're going to look at four different areas and then have that Q&A time at the end. And the first area... If you pull out that little booklet, go ahead and pull that out. It's broken into four main points at the beginning. The first one being, under number one, God loves you and created you to know him personally. He has a wonderful plan for your life. Now this sounded great. And to this day, this sounds great. But this whole part about God loves you, can we say that? especially in light of all the evil and suffering that's out there. Can we really believe that God, God does love? And as, as I looked into it more and more, I saw that there's something called the problem of evil that people laid out. And they've laid it out to communicate that we can't really believe that the God of the Bible is true. And there's a lot of people who follow this and come to the conclusion that, no, the God of the Bible can't be true. And it's something that I had to wrestle with, and I'd say something that many people have had to wrestle with through time and will continue to wrestle with when we consider the question, can we really believe God is good? And this is one of the ways it's laid out. Again, this has been laid out in different ways, different, by different people, using different terminology, but this is how it plays out. Number one, an omniscient or all-knowing being will know all about evil and suffering when and even before it happens. Number two, this word is hard for me to say, so bear with me. An omnibenevolent being will want the universe to be free of evil and suffering. I got it right the first time. I'll stumble as we go on. So omnibenevolent or all-good or all-loving being will want the universe to be free of evil and suffering. That's point two. Point three, an omnipotent or all-powerful being will be able to create, and I'd add, and also sustain, a universe free of evil and suffering. 
Number four, evil and suffering are present in our world. Okay, now if, if these four things are in place, this conclusion is warranted. It makes sense. It's a reasonable conclusion that an omniscient, omnibenevolent, omnipotent God does not exist. And many people have put this forth in, in, in philosophy departments, even religious studies departments, and said, hey, because one, two, three, and four are true, five is true, the God of the Bible is not real. And I had to wrestle with, and we all have to wrestle with, are one through four true? And as we look at these, well, number four, there have been a few who've said evil and suffering aren't present. But for the most part, people will conclude, yes, there's evil, there's suffering in the world. There'll be some discussion about to what degree or how much there is, but it's pretty much accepted that there is evil and there's suffering in the world. So one down. What about number one? An omniscient or all-knowing being will know about evil and suffering when and even before it happens. Well, that makes sense. I mean, if, if, if the being was all-knowing, like the Bible communicates, God being, well, then, then that being would know about evil and suffering when it happens and even before. So number one, I'd say, is, is reasonable. Now, number three, there's, there's a little bit of debate about an omnipotent or all-powerful being will be able to create a universe free of evil and suffering. And if you put certain disclaimers, that might not be, that might not be true, and you can, you can understand how it's, it's potentially not. However, just at the base of it, an all-powerful being, well, yeah, I mean, they could create such a universe and sustain it. They could do whatever they wanted to if they were all powerful. So I would say three is reasonable. Now, some of you might be saying, oh man, that's three already. It looks like, it looks like five is, is gonna be accurate. And some of you, probably most of you are saying, well, there's probably a reason he didn't just go one, two, three, and four. And the reason being, I think two is where this argument breaks down. An omnibenevolent or all good, all loving being will want the universe to be free of evil and suffering. When I first look at that, it seems reasonable. Well, wouldn't an all loving being want the universe to be free of evil and suffering? But when we step back and consider what that would mean, I would say it doesn't hold up. And there have been different ways of, of wrestling with this question. I don't have time to look at all of them today. And even the one I will look at, I'll only look at briefly. But there's a, a really good one that I'm, I'm not going to take on at all, the, the, which, which talks about how evil and suffering can bring, bring a lot of good about. It's sometimes referred to as, as the virtue defense. I think there's a whole lot to it, that evil and suffering can bring about good. So an all-loving being would have evil and suffering to bring about greater good. But the argument, uh, the, the evidence that I want to bring out here is often referred to as the free will defense for it. And again, our time is brief today. I wish we could have four hours and 45 minutes. Well, 45 minutes, we have to pick and choose, especially if we have Q&A. And so I'm going to summarize very briefly the, the free will defense to this. And it, it really comes down to considering, okay, well, what would it take for that being God to eliminate free will or to eliminate evil and suffering? Well, you'd have to eliminate it where it is, but also the potential of it. And philosophers have really come to two ways to do that. The first way is you could eliminate all beings who had the ability to cause evil and suffering. And most everyone would say, yeah, that, that's not really that great of an option. Because it would mean eliminating all mankind. And that world is not a better world. And a loving being would not choose that world over our present world. But there is a second option, which people have wrestled with. 
And, and there's been some different things in media, even, even shows like Twilight Zone and, and Tales from the Dark Side have, have wrestled with, well, what about taking away the free will? What about a, a situation where, where the beings who have free will would not have that free will? And only, they could only choose in the good way. Because that's what it would take to take away evil and suffering. It would be to take away the free will to potentially choose a choice that could cause evil and suffering from those beings. And like I've said, people have wrestled with, well, could a world be better like that? Most, most everything I've looked at has come to the conclusion that, well, no. A world of automatons, of, of robots, of, of people who didn't really have free will wouldn't, wouldn't be a better world than the world we have now. And they've concluded that, well, it's not, not only is it not a sure thing that an omnibenevolent being would want the universe would, and take the steps to eliminate evil and suffering, but not only is that not a sure thing, it's probably not even close to the best option. So as a result of, of wrestling with what it would mean to eliminate evil and suffering, Number two, I would make the case, breaks down. And thus, I, I would say that number five does not follow. And that it's reasonable to believe that the God of the Bible, an omniscient, omnipotent, and omnibenevolent God does exist, which was important for me to come to that point. Could I really believe that God loved and the God of the Bible is true? And as I wrestled through what many people point to as the toughest argument against it, came to the conclusion that it was reasonable. Which moves us on, turn to the page, the next page in this booklet. A question that I wrestled with and people wrestle with on pages four and five, the question is why would a good person be separated from God for eternity? I mean, eternity is a long time. And I used to, as, as a kid, I used to get freaked out sometimes because I'd think about Whoa, eternity, always here. Whoa, that's a long time. Then I cover my ears and say, ah, and, and just try to think about something else because it freaked me out. Okay. It's a long time. But to think about someone who seems like a good person being separated from God for eternity, that, that didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. And as I went through this, this page in this book, I saw the main title, People Are Sinful and Separated from God. Like, whoa, that's, that's pretty harsh. And then I saw these Bible verses, Romans 3.23, where it says, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then this verse at the very bottom, the wages, or, or what we earn, what we deserve from our sin, is death. And I had it explained to me that this, this word in the Greek, which New Testament language, for death is thanatos, and it means a spiritual separation from God. It's not referring to physical death. So putting these two verses together, I mean, okay, everyone has sinned, and as a result of our sin, we're going to be separated from God. And I was like, I, I, okay, the Bible says that, and that's, if, if the Bible is the word of God, that's, that's powerful. But does that make any sense? And to start with, I had to wrestle with, well, what is the biblical understanding of sin? How, how broad is it? You know, it, it's, what does it really mean? And that word in Romans 3.23 for sin could be understood. There's a Greek word that transliterated is, is basically hamartia. And it, it meant at the time missing the mark. From what I understand, it was also utilized in, uh, in, in different contexts. One of them was when people were involved in archery. How many of you have seen the movie 300? Okay, some of you. You see those like arrows going up and, and, and raining down, and you know, more movies are having that, those, those arrows rain down. It's kind of cool. I just saw Hercules had that recently. Hey, it, it was a fun movie. It wasn't the greatest, but Hercules had it. But the arrow's raining down, and I guess back in the time, back in the day, they would, there'd be like two archers practicing. 
and one would be way over in this area, one would be in this area, one would shoot, and they'd want to be as accurate as possible. So they'd draw up a target. And if the arrow landed within the target, who this guy might not be able to see because he was far away, this guy would yell mark. If it landed outside the target, he'd yell sin, or hamartia in, in the case of the Greek. So that was a use of the term which meant missing the mark. And I wrestle with, well, well, what does that mean? And, and sometimes I need examples that are extreme to, to be able to understand them. And I'll share it with you, okay, this, this extreme example that helped me to understand what was really going on with this missing the mark concept of sin. Let's say, let's say a couple guys, say these two guys right here, are roommates, okay? And this guy, what's your name? Caleb. What's your name? Caleb. Caleb. So Caleb is not getting along all that well with James. with James. They're both decent guys, but they're not getting along really well at this point. And Caleb says, you know what? It's Friday night. I'm, I'm going to just go over with some friends. We're just going to have a movie hangout time. He stops and gets some food, and he's ready to go over there. But before going over there, he decides to stop at the room to drop off a couple things and, and, and just pick up on the way. He walks into the room, and he's thinking, oh, I hope James is gone. I don't want to deal with him. Now, that's, that's hard for you guys to believe. You look at James, you see a great guy. Just picture it for this story, okay? So, all right. So Caleb comes in, and it's dark. And James is in his bed, and he, he moans, Caleb, can you get me some medicine? I'm not feeling good. Caleb says, what? He says, yeah, it's, it's over, at the, uh, over at the nurse's station. He tells him where it is. And it's only going to take probably five or ten minutes to get but Caleb th thinks to himself, well, do, should I really do that? I mean, I I've got plans. I want to get over and you know, watch the movie, hang out. What should I do? And There's probably tons of choice that he could make. Let me give you three possible options. Number one, he could think, well, hmm, love your neighbor as yourself. Yeah, I should probably go get it. It's, it's only going to take five or ten minutes. I should probably get him the medicine. He's in bad shape over here. Option two, you know what? He's a big guy, but he's in a weakened state. I might take this opportunity to mess, mess him up a little bit and, and go up and, and start, start wailing on him. That's option two. Okay. Now, we'd probably say number one is hitting the mark. Number two is, is not hitting God's mark. For just let me make that clear. But what about option three? Option three says, you know what? I wish you well, buddy, but I'm going to go to my movie. You know, some people might think, well, it's not sin. He's not doing anything wrong. He's not, he's not going and beating him up. He's just, it's a, a neutral thing. But if we go back to the idea of, of hitting the mark or missing the mark, it would be sin because he'd be missing the mark in that case. And as I understood that, that sin was missing the mark, it hit me even more. Wow, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Well, yeah, with an understanding that broad, sin is, is huge. We're sinning a lot. But then I had to wrestle with, well, okay, but no one's perfect. Why is the standard so high to be right with God? Why does sin or imperfection keep us out? And as I, I worked through the Bibles, I looked at it, it seemed that, that God created heaven, and Revelation plays us out, God created heaven to be a perfect place. Not only because he wanted to hang out there, but as a, as a gift for people. So he created this perfect place. And by definition, anything that's perfect can only have perfect elements added to it. You know, if you've got a perfect glass of water and drop one little drop of poison in there, it's not perfect anymore. That one drop of poison makes it imperfect. And so if heaven's going to be maintained as a perfect place, well, it makes sense that only perfect or perfected beings or things can enter it. And, and as I learn more, it's like, well, God's making it clear that he's going to do everything he possibly can to help people to become perfected through Christ, 
to get into that perfect heaven. But he's not going to shortcut it. He's not going to just say, well, yeah, people will be people. Just, just let them in. He's going to maintain that great gift, that perfect heaven. And this made sense to me. A couple years ago, I was on a missions project, and I was playing football with my boys who were about 10 and a couple other boys. And so we're, we're playing football, and they're having fun and everything. I was the all-time quarterback for the game. But two little kids wanted to come and play, and they were five and six. And we thought, well, you know, I like the kids. The other boys like the kids. Let's, let's let them play. Well, that became a disaster. And some of you who are laughing can anticipate some of the things that happened. When one of them would take the ball and just run off with it, one of them just laid on the ball. Uh, and I don't really understand the joy in that. But, but the, game, the game was pretty much ruined. So after that game, I sat down with the five and the six-year-old and, and explained to them, the best I could to a five and six-year-old, well, this is what football is. And if you want to play in the game, this is, you've got to follow the rules to it. Because I thought about, well, we want that game to be a good game. Three days later, we were playing. And the five and the six-year-old came up and wanted to play. And I said, okay, guys, are you willing to play by the rules? And one of them, the older one, said, we really want to run with the ball and lay on it. <laughs> and I thought about it, because I, I cared about these kids. I, I, I like these kids. But I also thought about the four boys who were playing. I thought, you know what? If, if they want to play by the right rules, we can have them play. But me being loving in this case, this case is not necessarily just letting the game be ruined. In this case, I believe it's, it's saying no to those two so that these four can have the great experience. Do everything I can for these two to be able to play. But if they're not willing to, say no to them. And I did. And they walked away crying. And their parents were mad at me. It, it was, it was kind of rough. But, but the point is, I walked away from that and I thought to myself, wow, that was hard for me, caring about those kids, to say no but I really think that was the right, th the right and loving thing to do, to maintain that game and the integrity of that game. And I thought, you know, that makes sense. God has heaven as a perfect place, a great place of joy. And he's going to maintain it as that. And he goes so far beyond what I did to make sure everyone can be part of it. But if people don't take the opportunity, it makes sense that he would maintain heaven. And have those people, even though they might seem good, and as I wrestle with sin, I saw that good is really in quotes, that they would be separated from him. It made sense as I looked into it. Now, if you turn to point three in the booklet, it says Jesus Christ is God's only provision for our sin. Through him alone, we can know God personally, experience God's love and plan. The question is, is it reasonable to believe that Jesus is the only way to be right with God? What about other religions? I mean, even at that time, I had, I had you know, people who were in our, in our little section of, in my dorm who were Muslim, Hindu, different religions, um, you know, people who, who weren't any religion. And I thought, well... Is it really reasonable to believe that Jesus is the only way? I wrestle with that. And if you look at page 7 of this booklet, there's a quote here from Jesus. It said, Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Hit me. Wow. Jesus saying he was the only way. I, and I looked at that verse. I was like, well... You know, what, what, what was he really saying in context? What, what, as I look into it more, is that really what he was saying? I became, became convinced, yes, that is what he was communicating in that verse. But then I saw something that, that verse is powerful and, and strong. But there's an example and a story that hit me even harder. It was later in Jesus' life, before he was going to go to the cross, and he was in a place called the garden where he was praying. 
And in this garden, he was praying to the Father. And I'm going to paraphrase now, but he, he said, for the most part, Father, if it's possible, let's use some other way to make people right with God. Take this cup from me, was the, was the term he used, if possible. But if this is the way, if this is the only way, I'm willing to do it. Now, again, that's a paraphrase. But Jesus communicated that I don't want to do it this way. I'd love there to be another way. But I'm willing. I'm willing if this is the only way. And the Bible communicates that later he willingly went to the cross. So not only did he say it, but he lived it out and was convinced that he was the only way, even though he was hoping for a different way. So I need to step back, especially now as a follower of Christ, and wrestle with, well, what do I do with that? And as I think about how I respond to that, I think about an example that's, that's somewhat parallel that I've considered. Did any of you see the place, as, as, as you went touring yesterday, where Martin Luther King Jr. spoke? Did anyone, a couple of you saw it? Okay. The, the place where he delivered his message. And everything I know about Martin Luther King Jr., he seems like he was a, just a fantastic guy. And there was no doubt that he was excited about racial equality and civil rights. He, he talked about racial equality and civil rights. He, much of his life was consumed with that, and he was, he was killed because of that. Now, what if I were to say to someone, hey, I'm a... I'm a follower of Martin Luther King Jr. But I'm not really big on racial equality and civil rights. I don't really believe in racial equality and civil rights. What would that person think? What would you think? Okay, don't say it. Because <laughs> I can anticipate, well, you'd be an idiot. You'd be stupid. All, all kinds of different things. But in your mind, you'd say, it wouldn't make sense. Martin Luther King Jr. talked about those things. He lived for those things, and he died for those things. How can you call yourself a follower of him if, you're not, if you don't hold to those same things? It's the, only, the only reasonable position if you're a follower is to hold to those things. As I think about that, I think back to my situation with, with Jesus Christ. If I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, and he talked about being the only way, and he lived for that. He also died. And I mean, Martin Luther King was, was a martyr, no doubt, but he didn't die willingly. Jesus died willingly. And so for me to say, well, I, I'm a follower of, of, of Jesus Christ, but I don't really believe he's the only way, it wouldn't be any more reasonable than a follower of Martin Luther King Jr. saying they didn't believe in racial equality and civil rights. So as I consider that, I, I need to think also, well, but wait, that doesn't make me any more, any better than someone who believes something else. It doesn't make me better. It doesn't make me more devoted or, or, or devout necessarily. But it's definitely a reasonable, a reasonable position for me to hold. And I'd say it's really the only reasonable, reasonable position for a follower of Jesus Christ to hold. Now we're on to the last one, point four. How committed does a person need to be to come into a relationship with God through Jesus Christ? Like it says in point four, we must individually receive Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And then we can know God personally and experience his love and plan. And I need to wrestle with, well, is it just believing some things? What does it look like? What, what needs to be in place? And there are a lot of good things about this booklet. This paragraph in the middle of page 9 is, I think, my favorite part of the booklet. And I've got it up here. You can look on up here or, or look here as well. Would, would someone be willing to read this just so we can all follow along? Receiving Christ involves turning to God for himself, repentance, and trusting Christ to come into our lives to forgive us of our sins and to make us who he wants us to be. Just to agree intellectually that Jesus Christ is the Son of God 
and that to die with the cause for our sins is not enough, nor is it enough to have an emotional experience. We receive Jesus Christ by faith as an act of the will. Thank you. Thank you. And like I said, I, I really think this, this lays it out well. I mean, it's, it's turning to God himself and, you know, being willing to ask him to, to come into our lives and, and make us what he wants us to be. It's not just agreeing intellectually or believing some things in our head, but being willing to say, you know what? I want to receive Jesus Christ by faith as an act of the will. And this brings me back to so that place where I was at, I, I didn't want to just take some blind leap of faith where I just threw out all reason, but took a step of faith. And I, there's, a, there's a good picture of this in the movie Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. How many of you have seen this? Indiana Jones, okay, a, a few of you. Well, Indiana Jones, the main character, had to get through, he, he was on a quest for the Holy Grail, the, the little goblet that, that Christ drank from. At the, at the Last Supper, as I understand it. So he's on this quest, and he has this book that his father put together that told him how to get through these, these different tests that were in, in the movie. And at this one place, <clears throat> he gets to this place where there's a huge chasm from one end to the other. And he needs to somehow get across, but it, how can he do it? He can't jump anywhere near that far. But he has this book. And this book, which he needed to come to a place where he believed it, this book communicated that if he took a step and went down a little bit, there would be a platform for him to walk across. He had to wrestle with, wow, can I really believe that this book is communicating the right things so that I can take that step? I can't see it, but can I take that step? For him, it wasn't just running and jumping anywhere. It was looking at the evidence that his father and, and, and at least another guy had worked on putting together, looking at the evidence and saying, okay, I can't see it, but I'm willing to take a step. And he did, and as you can guess, the path was there, and, and he went across. But for me, and I'd, I'd say for us, it's getting to the place where, well, yes, we can, we can see that it's reasonable, but it's still, still taking that step of faith. How committed, how, how convinced do we need to be? Well, I'll, I'll let you know, when I was at that place, I wasn't perfect. And I'm not now either. And I don't even, I, sometimes I, I, I think back to it and I was probably thinking, well, God, I, I, I don't know. I'm not probably the person that you'd want me to be. And if I'm honest, I don't even know sometimes if I want to be that person. But I had to wrestle with, but did I want Jesus? Did I want him to come into my life for who he was? Because even back then I understood, it's not like he's, you're driving in your life and he just comes in the back seat and you say, well, Jesus, come in and I'll just take you wherever. He's not really like that. He comes in and starts driving, you know, and, and that's why even where it says, makes us what he wants us to be, we need to understand, and I needed to understand who I was placing my faith in. Jesus is, is Lord, and that's not just his first name, Lord Jesus Christ. He's king. <laughs> He's master. And, and I needed to wrestle with, am I willing to, to place my faith in him? It wasn't about being perfect. It wasn't about getting clean or anything. But it was being willing to say, Christ, for all you are, I want you to come in. And I'm willing to have you make me the person you want me to be. And I know that some of you have, some of you in here have done that. Have said, yes, I, I, Jesus, I, I receive you as my Savior and Lord. And, you know, like me, there's probably been a lot of ups, maybe some downs. You know, it's, it doesn't mean your life is perfect. But it's great to have Jesus as, as Savior and Lord. For those of you who haven't, I would say, you know, it wasn't just, a, just an absolute quick thing for me. Say, so really consider it. And even, even ask God, God, I, I, can I really believe this? And be willing, because some people are like, well, I need to see everything. I need to know everything. Well, you're not going to know everything. But on the other hand, it's not a blind leap of faith. It's a step. 
and be willing to say, you know what? I'm not going to ever know everything, but I'm willing, am I willing to take that step of faith? And if you haven't done that, I'd say it's great. I'd, I'd say check it out and consider it. And I want to I close our time in prayer um, to this, this God that, that I've, I've, I came to follow in college. I've enjoyed and I've, I've really loved the, the journey of, of wrestling with these things, knowing that he wants me to love him with not only my, my heart and my soul, my strength, but also my mind. That's great. So let, let me pray. God, thank you for, for this opportunity to come before you and to, to read your word and to see things that, that might seem clear and, and often are absolutely clear as we look into them more and things we can wrestle with. Thank you for the example of Jesus who came, who lived, and who died, convinced that he was the only way and willing to sacrifice because of that fact. God, thank you for all these people. I thank you for the chance to serve you and, and, and know a relationship with you. And, and thank you that, that Jesus, that you're a, a Savior that we can trust in and know that, that you've got our back and, and you've got the lead as well. Thank you so much for this time, God. I pray that you continue to, to work in us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Thanks, everyone.